Ritzman is also a senior advisor of CEP, so we stacked a little bit the deck here today, and heads the areas of CV and PV and digital regulation and content moderation at CEP Germany. He's also a member of the steering committee of the Radicalization Awareness Network, RAN of the European Commission, and an associate fellow at the German Society for Foreign Policy, DGAP, of many of you may have already heard of, where he helped to set up the Forum for Expert Exchange on Countering Islamist Extremism, InfoX, a very innovative approach, bringing organizations together, which is carried out in cooperation with the Federal Office for Migration of Refugees, BAM. From 2007 to 17, Mr. Ritzman worked for the European Foundation for Democracy in Brussels. And from 2012 to 15, he was a consultant for the MENA region or for the German development agency GIZ in their office in Cairo. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. Now, these were two very sober yet inspiring presentations by Irene and by Hani. So what I will try to do is to fuse policy and science together uh, when talking about uh, this, this issue. Let me start my presentation for you. Now, thinking outside the box, um, I think is necessary because we have now the opportunity to rethink and rebuild the e-commerce directive. And uh, the title is uh, following also Hani's uh, suggestions, a bit uh, you know, controversial, the truth about social media, because that will keep you looking into this, because if I tell you the truth will come out, you might stay. So, but let me start by irritating you. And you might ask why, because what I said, let's not only think within the existing framework, let's think about systemic um, ideas, let's reconsider how we look at the issues at hand. So there was a time when we thought that smoking is about freedom. And maybe not everybody thought that, but it was legal and it was in the media and it was a billion dollar industry to promote that smoking is making you feel free, right? Now, I don't know if you guys have seen anyone here, the movie, Thank You for Smoking, which I found always very enlightening, where a tobacco lobbyist basically and his friends manipulate the policymakers, the public and everybody else into a pro-tobacco position and against regulating tobacco. And now this now leading to the Digital Services Act and social media and video sharing platforms. What are they really about? I mean, this is, this is maybe, maybe the, the question I would like to start with. They were never invented to be gardens of free speech. Social media have not been invented to promote free speech. Ask the investors, the first investors and the last investors, they will not tell you that they invested their money so people can speak freely, but to make more money. So have we been manipulated? Probably, but we also have projected our desires that we wanted the internet and social media to be gardens of free speech, of freedom of expression, of human rights. And, you know, looking at the companies, we can say, you fooled us once with your, you know, strategic communications, shame on you, but we've also wanted to believe that. So this is not about blaming, but about reflecting. The social media companies are basically they sell access to their users' data to third parties. And they offer a free service to those users. That is it, no magic, no gardens of free speech. They are not public squares. They are more like virtual shopping malls with big speakers' corners. House rules trump freedom of expression. And you can try that at your local shopping center. After this webinar, go there and start giving a speech. Start singing a song, start playing music through your boombox and see what happens. Someone will probably approach you and say, hey, there are house rules here and we don't want you to do that. And this is basically what the community standards of the social media platforms and video sharing platforms are about. Therefore, we just need to treat social media and video sharing exactly like we would treat any other industry, like the pharma industry, the food industry, the banking industry, based on the potential harm 
that their services or products pose to EU citizens. The kind of wunderkind, you know, from the 90s to through 2000, the all carrots, no sticks, let's not regulate them, let's have them grow and see what happens. Now we've seen what happened. And I sometimes wonder who told us that social medias are about free speech and human rights. Like actually, and I also wonder if there will be maybe a movie at some point that is, will be called uh, Thank You for Liking that looks into that. Who actually gave this narrative and that framing to us? Now, what we did at CEP is we actually started an investigation in a core component of the Network Enforcement Act of Germany, but also it's the same component for the Digital Services Act, which is the notice and takedown notice and action mechanism. And for that, we looked for manifestly illegal content, meaning that this is content that has been decided by court of law in Germany that it is illegal. And then we reported that content uh, through the NetsDG forms, through uh, to um, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, and uh, Instagram. And we also wanted to see basically the theory of change behind this. Does notice and takedown solve the problem at hand? Does notice and takedown make those uh, providers of services safer? So we picked 92 manifestly illegal content. Uh, we reported them and the overall results were not great. It was just 43.5% 40, were taken down. YouTube was actually the worst of, of all of them. Um, they sometimes blocked identical content, then they, when reported another time uh, in an upload, in a different upload, did not block. So we did not understand what the criteria were for sometimes blocking, sometimes not blocking the same content. And Facebook blocked the content, but we reported contact in a specific profile in a folder full of illegal content. So Facebook only uh, blocked the content that we reported that was surrounded by hundreds of other pieces who were also illegal. So Facebook acted legally correct. They only took down what was reported to them, what was given notice to them, and they didn't look at the profile that had hundreds of other pieces of content. Right? So who is supposed to inform, who is supposed to police, who is supposed to protect users? Is it me? or my colleagues in the evenings when we browse through Facebook. Um, and just uh, as a side note, we gave the research to the companies um, and our research was 100% correct in terms of what was illegal and also the process. So this was considered a very uh, correct approach. Now, that's why we think that simply taking notice and takedown as the core point of how to regulate police and mandate companies to have a compliance system and in internal um, is actually probably not enough. Um, it only works if illegal content is being found, reported, and then blocked and removed effectively, right? So it is based on trust and chance because the companies say, trust us, we're taking care of this. And the rest is chance that users like you and I report things. And then there's a couple of internet referral units that I will speak about a little later. So there's no effective systematic and continuous monitoring um, regarding illegal content, the manifestly illegal content where there's a government ban uh, supported by a court order. Um, nobody's looking for that proactively, it seems, and if so, only selectively, and we don't even know why um, or how, actually. Automated systems, Hani spoke about them, they are all over the place. Everything you see has been curated, recommended, managed, pushed up or down, left or right. So it's really not about should we have upload filters. Um, it's only about do we need regulation to control upload filters. So there's a movement of uh, civil society organizations and members of parliament in Brussels who say we should not have upload filters in the regulation, which would, would as a result decrease civil rights in the European Union because these filters are implemented, as Hani mentioned, 
24-7 regarding pornography, illegal uh, child illicit uh, pornography, um, regarding um, um, uh, copyright infringements, and also partially on other illegal contents or unwanted content. So it's not about should we have these filters, is the question should be how should regulation look like so we know what the filters actually are doing and so that we also can look at their effectiveness and uh, in a, a transparent uh, sense. So actually here regulation would increase civil liberties compared to the status quo. Explainable transparency and capable oversight. Transparency is something like sustainability. Everybody kind of likes it. Nobody really knows what it is. We need to be much more serious about this topic. Uh, everybody loves it. The companies love it. They do transparency reports, they say, which are marketing reports because there's no way to check what they're doing. Um, we need to find out because the whole system is based on that the companies decide what they can see. There's no dark corner on social media. Everything there, everything I do, everything I look at, everything I click on is being to some degree recorded and then uh, processed for the profit part of the company. So, but the company still then decides on what they want to look at. Where do the engineers that they have look at? Where do they allocate resources? And this can lead to the fun fact that, for example, Facebook can say, we're taking down 99% of illegal content, yet when you go on Facebook, you find it everywhere because they decide where they look, what it is that is illegal and what they do with it. And there are many studies that uh, show similar results, not just ours. Um, so we're kind of skeptical regarding the constant success uh, um, 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 uh, communication by the companies. There is an association called EDIMA of the big companies, the big social media companies in Brussels. Um, they also gave their insights to the DSA and they said that um, uh, transparency and oversight should be restricted to broad measures, right? So they, um, I'm just saying that because it seems everybody's for transparency, but then we have to really look into the details. What does that mean? And industry, of course, and, and maybe that's not something we can blame them for, um, are not very happy to open up the books. But I wonder which other industry is allowed to self-audit and self-report? who is doing the homework and then grading it as well. So proactive search is, is a thing looking for manifestly illegal content. Right now we have the trust us thing, the users like you and me and some internet referral units. We think that third parties with expertise need to be commissioned to do that on a, on a sustainable level, uh, systematically uh, monitoring the companies, helping them, but also checking if they're actually doing what they say they're doing. Right now, in all of the European Union, the estimate is that there are 450 police officers who sit and, at computers like you do right now, who manually, meaning by typing search terms into their computer, look for illegal content. 450 for 450 million citizens. That's where we are right now. There's very little automated systems at work in these internet referral units, again telling you that most illegal things are not being found and uh, also because very few people are actually looking for it. So to finish the DSA consultants, uh, uh, consultations, um, Irene uh, talked about it. We have given our input uh, into the first stage already, and we will publish a policy paper where we will also highlight what Honey um, uh, mentioned earlier, the recommendation algorithms and their role of uh, shaping the discourse and promoting uh, harmful content and also illegal content. We have two papers that you could look at on the research I just mentioned and also uh, regarding automated decision making, which we will include in the email that you will receive after this webinar, probably tomorrow. Thank you very much.